So this is the table of content. Uh, we'll, we're gonna have a brief introduction about the failover scenario. We're gonna have like the first steps of reading metrics, trying to make a better, make a better diagnosis. We're gonna be like, let's uh, check in the isolation and establish, uh, stabilize our services, documentation, and we're gonna have a brief summary. So um, the session's goal are defining, uh, at the end of the session, where you will be able to define an execution plan uh, when a service is degraded or start failing. When we start like seeing this kind of behaviors in our infrastructure, we can define an execution plan. We should identify possible applications, isolate them and get back to a stable state. I'm gonna be sharing you like um, my tips and tricks about how can we do this part of uh, the isolation. Uh, we're gonna be like defining a document uh, to, to grind down your efforts of your team when incidents happen and make plan for the future over um, when once the emergencies, emergencies are resolved and uh, we can set uh, a clear path for, for the next steps in the future. Uh, as briefly introduction, let me, oh, sorry, I skip one. Uh, as we briefly introduction, let me summarize what we are trying to, to understand. Um, we are in charge of a set of services that are consumed through a mobile or web application. And those services can be RESTful APIs or, or it can be um, whatever you think, but the idea is that we have these services um, deployed in a virtual machine. Um, and this virtual machine basically is based on Linux. So these VMs are behind maybe a load balancer or covered by the, an auto-scaling group. And part of the infrastructure will look like this. We have our web and client applications that are consumed via load balancer. And maybe I'm not sharing like the exposure of this load balancer to the public um, network, but let's assume that it's happening. And we have this EC2 instance, and this is for AWS, but it can be replicated to many cloud providers, let's say GSP or Azure. So these instances are being served, well, are being covered by our auto scaling group. And we have defined a threshold that is maybe a best basic threshold, nothing fancy that increments via CPU or memory, whatever. Let's say that we start with this infrastructure for, for the beginning, right? And this application is consuming, uh, uh, well, reading and writing from a database. So that's like our basic scenario. We have this infrastructure uh, whatsoever uh, at the beginning of, of, of this part of, of our scenario. And let's say that we release a new version of our application and this version has been deployed in the morning and you know, uh, applications and versions melts when you have the most fear, you, you, you need to go out on Friday or, you know, something like that. The, the releases knows, knows when you have more hurry. And the, the part of this is that the integrate, we have integrated in the pipeline different tests and to ensure quality from the uh, quality assurance team. And maybe we didn't cover at all. And at the, at, at, at the simple view, uh, this test needs to cover some parts, but we are not sure about that. And apparently no warnings or error have been triggered in a couple of minutes. So we are good to go. We're packing our stuff. And then suddenly after a couple of hours, an alarm has been triggered with some requests returning a status of 500, but most of this request seems to be taking longer than normal. Um, the issue is that uh, we start seeing uh, a degradation of the system because the API or the RESTful API was responding in the order of 100 milliseconds and now is 1,200 milliseconds. So it's over more than a, than a second and, and we start like getting like not really, really confident about this release, but this is fine. Maybe we can find solutions and the idea is what should we do now? For, for From this part of we start seeing this degradation, maybe we start seeing that our application takes longer, some services are stuff like getting, you know, the spin off uh, of uh, the icons and we can struggle about, we can live there. Uh, we can leave the system doing that kind of stuff. So let me share with you the first steps that uh, I will do in, if, if, 
I'm in that particular scenario situation. And the first point is reading metrics. Sometimes metrics can help us a lot. It can be boring, but can help us a lot about what we are trying to achieve. The first thing we should do is check in the server if, if it's an actual load issue uh, with a command. I also, um, like the first command I try to type is uptime. It's really easy. Um, the uptime command tell us how many days and when the, the service started, how many users are logging, but we're looking for the load average. And this load average is, are gonna give us three different numbers, 5.24, 3.6 and 2.82. But what uh, those numbers, what does it mean, right? Those numbers represent the average of the load system over a period of one, five and 15 minutes respectively. So we can say, that we have a load average of 5.2 uh, a minute ago, then 3.6 minutes ago, and 2.8 uh, 15 minutes ago. The load average represents the average number of processes that have to wait for a CPU time. And uh, let's assume this that an idle system in theory should have a load average of zero. I I created like this um, representation of how we look the load, load average if, if, if we have like this um, start with cashiers. And let's say that we start with an uh, average load of zero and then suddenly came a process that want to buy uh, something or process some data. And now we have a average load of one. So then in a couple of uh, five minutes, uh, four processes came to the CPU or the processor and tried to uh, uh, use the CPU. So now the system tells us that we have a load average of four. But when we start seeing that is like, all these processes are waiting time to be processed by the processor. So we can say that we have kind of a load, uh, a high load right now because for one cashier, um, it's gonna take maybe 20 minutes, maybe more or less, to, to process all these uh, requests from different processes. So what, what should we do? Uh, maybe the first stuff in, in, in this kind of scenarios will be like, well, let's do a vertical increase of our resources, right? So maybe we can add another processor to our server and we, we're gonna have a, a dual processor. Uh, and maybe the, the four processes that were in line were distributed between the two cashiers. Uh, a question to the public, and it's free to say uh, anyone can answer, what could be the average low right now for, for this, this particular system with uh, four processes and two processors? Anyone? You can write it in chat if you're kind of shy, don't, don't worry. Or you can unmute yourself. And share with yeah, everybody. <laughs> four. Distributed. For me, it's four. Four? Who gives more? Who, who, who gives less? <laughs> or who agrees? Two. Okay, Kristen. Thanks. Two. Great. L let me. Okay, two again. It's, it's winning the two, Rachel. What do you think? What's going to be the uh, load average for this? Uh, I'm scenario? not sure. <laughs> you can think okay. reveal I'd win. Yeah, I can reveal the result. It's going to be four. Because remember, the load average is the number of processes we are trying to process at the same time. It doesn't matter how many cores we have. And that can be tricky because if, if we start seeing like the load average is going to 10, 20, uh, and you start like getting worried that maybe 100, you start getting worried about, the, well, we have a lot of processes waiting for the process. Yeah, but we, you have a 12 core processor. So maybe this, this load is distributed between all our processors. So uh, it's relative how high is the load height uh, depends on the number of processors also. For this particular scenario, uh, a load of four is not the same to be processed by the one cashier rather than two cashiers. So we need to take considerations about the load average and the number of processors we have in our servers. So let's say that we have now uh, eight, pro uh, eight processes waiting to be processed. 
this could be really a worst scenario being just held by one processor. So can you see like the, the immense um, help that we have with uh, two processors? And now if we write uptime in our server, we're gonna be like the load average of eight, four and one. Like uh, uh, one minute ago, we have like eight, proce uh, eight processes trying to be processed uh, or average load of eight. Then five minutes ago, we see like we have four in line and then uh, 15 minutes ago, we see one. So we can take a little diagnosis of that 15 minutes ago or five minutes ago, the things got uh, start getting worse. Maybe we spawn a lot of processes, maybe a new processor will start like taking uh, you know, uh, more CPU uh, that we were expecting, maybe our application to start processing images or processing a, a report, I don't know, but this, this gives you like the idea when start happening the, the, the high load of the average load. Then suddenly and automatically we start seeing like all the processes uh, start like going um, down and we see like the average load of five, then an hour load of three. And then suddenly the server is going to a normal or an idle state with one. So the representation, if we run, uh, run again the uptime comment, you will see that we see, we'd have uh, five, uh, one minute ago, sorry, at a three, five minutes ago at five, and 15 minutes ago in eight. So we can ensure with, if we run like this, this command and say, okay, 15 minutes ago, we, we were in a high load. Right now it's getting, it's getting better. It's nothing to worry about. We can say that the system is recovering from a uh, high load state. So you're gonna say, tell me Edwin, so is high load a bad thing? Um, what's a good threshold to avoid high load? And that depends. The threshold uh, will be a combination of different factors. The, the first one will be the resources in our server, memory, CPU, uh, the IO uh, port for writing and reading, but it's gonna be depend, it, it, gonna, it gonna depends on how our application is defined, the logic behind it. So setting a threshold at sometimes when uh, engineers told me, well, I'm gonna set a threshold of 17% for the CPU. And my first question is why? Why 70%? Is there a particular number you have in mind for that? All the answers is, well, it's getting, it's a, it's a standard threshold. It's something from good practices. I would say the good practice is go deep and understand really well your application and define your threshold based on that. And we're gonna see that in, in, a, in a couple of slides. Is high load a bad thing? Not really. Sometimes uh, we need a, a server working really in, 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 it's like a machine that, well, in fact, the server is a machine, but we see like um, some things need to be cached in order like to respond faster. Let's say that you're opening a file and at the first time when you're opening the, the program and the file is getting like start uh, really, really the, the service start like really getting like a little bit slow, but then suddenly, uh, everything is cash, everything is up and running. And maybe a high load it is not a bad thing. It's something that the servers require, you know, like to, to be processing everything faster or working everything faster. And again, different factors can trigger high load, each of which affect permanently uh, performance differently. And we're gonna see like something like, uh, which are the things that can go wrong in high load. When we're troubleshooting based on average load, the important thing is to understand why is the load high. So normally they are falling in three categories. is the CPU load um, that we were like checking with the average load in the uptime command. Maybe it's a memory load issue, or maybe it's an IO load that constantly go with uh, waiting for reading uh, files from a disk or some peripherals. And this is my second favorite command. The top command is basically you can find top everywhere. And the idea of top is that once you run top, you can search for different factors. This, this is the first one is for the CPU and it's divided in different categories. Uh, 
more than 30% 30, uh, 30 is used by the user. US is for user. 1.4 is for the system. Um, this part is for idle state, but um, sorry, this part is for idle state. So we can see like um, one third of the, almost one third of, of our, no, one quarter of our system is used by the, the user, but most of them is in an idle state. And this, this part of the 1.4 is way, way at, well, WA, that is waiting for an IO execution, mostly of the disk. So uh, summary is user, system, idle state, and waiting for an IO interruption for writing to the disk. So as we can see, this system is healthy because we have six, uh, more or less 64% of the state idle. The idle state is not waiting, is waiting for, for uh, some processes to be processed. And also we have like this column that we can see how many CPU percentage is taking those processes. Let's say that from all the processes we have, 58% is from MySQL, 55 is from uh, Web1. <laughs> Don't worry, uh, you can share the idea with everyone. And then we have like uh, for the that, uh, sorry, this is not the users and these are the comments uh, for MySQL and um, PHP. So we can say that we don't have like a high load with the CPU. Uh, um, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, we can say that we have a lot of uh, processes taking over the processor, but it's not a big deal at all. We are seeing like the idle state is fine and we have like 32% uh, of our processors being invoked by the, uh, by the user. If we go to the memory load and uptime can give you um, good hints about the memory, uh, memory load. And this is kind of tricky. Let me explain why. Sometimes, and um, you can see like this number is de decreasing uh, over time from time to time. And you just start like seeing like the total amount of memory and the usage amount of memory, this number is starting like getting lower and lower and lower. And then you see like the free, uh, the, sorry, this is gonna be increasing. Sorry, the use is gonna be increasing, but the free space is gonna be getting lower and lower and lower. And one thing that you should uh, be aware guys is that Linux systems in particular, once you open a file, uh, the system refused to close it. And uh, these files is stored in memory. Most of the time, these files are not, uh, and it's really serious. You open a file, a text file, and it's, it's open all the time or uh, unless you reboot the system. So these files, these cache files are something that Linux uh, works in that way. Uh, it, it's not a big deal. Sometimes you can say, well, I, I'm gonna create like my swap uh, disk for, for, for RAM. And sometimes let the let Linux manage that. It's it does a, a great way of doing the catch. But the the best way to, you can be sure about that we don't have a memory issue is if you sum or try to sum the cache files in this column and the free space. And if that gives you a number that doesn't makes you feel uncomfortable with that, it's going to be part of the chunk of your total memory. It's fine. And the issue with the swap memory is that sometimes, uh, as I was mentioning to you, the, the system tends to open a lot of files and let them cache. And the issue with that is, imagine that comes another process and takes more memory, and another process takes more memory, and suddenly the swap system starts saying, okay, we don't have enough memory because we have everything cached. So we are gonna be swapping the memory between the disk and the memory. And we are gonna be getting in a spiral um, of downgrading our memory because the next process that is gonna be open is gonna be um, storing the information in disk. And reading from disk is slower than reading from memory. So we're gonna be in this game of trying to save in the disk, reading from the disk, loading into the memory, and suddenly we're gonna have two issues, memory load and IO load with the disk. So try to see if these cache files can be uh, pushed from some way or something like that. If we start seeing like, and we're gonna be checking the IO load, how can we ensure that it's an IO load? But 
this can happen from systems that have hasn't been rebooted from a long time servers that have been for years uh, up and running so maybe we can find out a different way but if this part of the cache and the free makes sense to a, a percent of the memory that's going to be free or it's going to be used it's okay don't you don't need to worry about it. Also, we have like the, uh, as a CPU, we have um, the percent of memory used by different processes, like MySQL again, PHP and Memcache and Apache. So not a big deal that I see because the cache, it's bigger than the free and we're still seeing like numbers really similar to the total amount. So it's not a memory load. And let's say that we start seeing like a little bit of concern with the memory and we need to see if this is an IO load issue. So the next command I like to run is, uh, is IOTOP and IOSTAT. We IOTOP, we can see um, how many transactions per, se per second we have in different disks and the bulk reads and the bulk writes on each disk. So we start seeing like a, bulk, uh, a lot of reads in, in, in the first device. So it's kind of concern. And remember sometimes um, systems tend to have different um, Applications that say well, we are we are performing a, a backup for that server. The system start uh, doing a backup, and a backup can read uh, the whole disk, and it can create a, a whole. It's not a, a really damage, but remember that reading from the disk is an intensive uh, process. So it can be a degradation of our system because this process is trying to read a lot of information from the disk and trying to pull the data out from the server and trying to perform this, um, this uh, backup. Or maybe it's an intense process that we released this morning that is gonna be reading from, from different files. Maybe it's getting all the images of all the users, compressing this file and try to store in an S3 bucket, I don't know. Maybe uh, we are doing a process that is reading a lot of information from the disk and between the spiral of loading everything to the memory and, and trying to read from the disk is gonna create a memory and IO load issue. On the other hand, IO stat can give us uh, hints about um, who is executing which command and the operations that are being processed in that particular moment. And we see that like here the rsync is getting a lot of uh, disk read uh, transactions and the number of kilobytes per second of, that, of those transactions that we are re reading. So maybe this can give you a hint of which processes are reading or writing in our system and we can do something maybe uh, stop the rsync command because we don't want that in that particular moment or anything else. So let's talk about isolation and stabilize our system. Once we identify what is the load uh, or the high load that we're experiencing from CPU, memory, or IO, we need to track our unhealthy instance because we, we take a, a quick peep about what is going on in the servers, what is going on in our instances, and now we can isolate it to prevent future harm, right? While the instance is running uh, and maybe we can allow that for future inf investigation. Sometimes engineers ask me if it's okay to just restarting. And I could say yes and no, because particularly if we restart an instance that it has um, data that is being processed, it is being processing for a long period of time or something like that. And we just shut down the instance, we're gonna lose data. So the, the idea, um, uh, the ideal approach is going to be isolate that instance. Identify if the instance is part of an autoscaling group or attached to a load balance before performing the quarantine. So we can see in our um, diagram that this is an autoscaling group. So the idea for an autoscaling group is first detach the, the instance to prevent being terminated by the autoscaling group service due to fail checks, uh, fail health, uh, failing health checks. If we start seeing like, maybe this is part of a degradation, but if we start seeing 100 uh, error in, in, in our request, maybe the, the um, auto scaling group is gonna terminate that instance and we're gonna maybe lose data or the most important about the isolation is uh, perform forensic analysis about what is going on with that distance, maybe a root cause analysis of 
what triggered this high load at the beginning. And for elastic load balancer, this, let's say we don't have an auto scaling group, you will need to deregister it to prevent the load balancer for attempting sending for the request. If we start seeing degradation, maybe we can um, deregister on, uh, this service one that it has a degradation and spin up a new instance, a fresh new instance, and avoid to have all the requests. And maybe we can win time in, in that part. And uh, once we understand what is happening, maybe we can integrate this, the, the instance or terminate it, uh, a disease. But we cannot terminate just for terminate the, an instance without knowing what happened. Once the instance is isolated, as I was mentioned, um, the autoscaling group will handle the demand of the application and, it's, and, it's, uh, and spin up the necessary instances. And when, it's, uh, when our investigation is done, uh, I suggest that we can shut it down and destroy the instance. Documentation about this. The first thing we should do is to take notes of every event and the people involved. It's necessary that um, we need to, if, if something of this is happening, obviously we, you need to first isolate and set an stable mode of our application. From then in a the, in the couple of minutes, once the, in, uh, the incident is stabilized, we need to make this summary of what happened, what, what, what really happened with, uh, with the application and the people that were checking this application try to set a timeline. Uh, this is really a great idea of setting a time lab and timeline. And you can construct this timeline with the help of the logs and recreate the incident, but always based on facts because um, presenting only facts will help avoid uh, blame other people or other teams and support a deeper analysis. Once you start like doing facts about what happened, you remove the bias of, well, the development team released a new version. It's not our issue. No, we're a team. We're trying to be really objective about what we did wrong. Maybe it's something else. Maybe the code itself was right, but something, maybe a dependency was failing. Maybe the installation or the packaging of the application was failing. I don't know. It will be different factors that we need to really, really understand before um, blame someone, we need to be really percent about the, the facts we are trying to get down. Uh, timelines include important changes and status impact applications and the key actions taken by the responders. Let's say that um, I create this timeline and uh, first of all, I start seeing like the application was degraded because uh, it was trigger 500s and I start seeing like all the requests start taking a lot of time. Then suddenly I go to the instance, I SSH the instance, and I, wrote, I, I run the uptime command and then the top command. And I get the, the, I get the idea that this was like um, uh, an external command, the RC command that start taking a lot of, uh, of the processes for reading the disk. And then I shut down that command and everything is start work up, uh, up and running uh, as normal. That could be like the summary, but you need to be facing like this timeline with times, uh, sorry, with uh, timestamps, uh, particularly when that events happen, how you react, if you ask for help, who, who respond to that call. To avoid hindsight bias, start your timeline at a point before the incident. Maybe you can go back 15 minutes or 30 minutes before the incident happened. and start seeing that uh, maybe the logs in, in, in our repository, maybe, uh, a new release happened, maybe it was a degradation of AWS, I don't know, but you, can, you, you need to go before the incident. And that way, before the incident, you can start writing forward your, your timeline instead of backwards. We need to measure impact objectively uh, by answering the following questions. How long was the impact visible? And this is important. If you only notice the, the impact, but no one else, it's okay. Uh, but try to make sure that who saw also the, the, this impact? Most of the time is the CEO and the CTO. I don't know why, but most of the time are the heads of the organization rather than the users. So how many times were the user's customer affected? And how many times, let's say, maybe operations, maybe, um, maybe a model that starts failing for users as customer, how many times do you receive maybe 500s or degradation of the systems? 
how many customers were affected. And this is really important because we are dealing with people and uh, people's data. So we need to make a summary of, hey, uh, maybe 100 customers were affected because they were trying to um, upload their uh, profiles or doing a payment or trying to um, make a purchase in our system. How many customers wrote uh, or called for support about the incident? And we need to contact other areas like uh, support. And uh, maybe in that way, we can see uh, how good our, are our efforts for communicating uh, our customers that we can support them. And maybe we don't have enough channels, you know, like users can call, who, who called? No one, but everyone is really angry. And maybe we can give hints to the, the customer side, the pre-sales or, or the marketing, you know, like engage a better communication when things can go wrong. And what functionally was affected and how severely. This is also trying to understand the models were involved in this, uh, the, the part of the infrastructure that was involved in this uh, incident and how severely. If we deleted 100 records because something bad happened, well, it's bad. And we need to take the severity and the complexity of this incident. Even though we did an analysis at the beginning and it was a really uh, fast analysis because time is money in, in that particular situation. So we need to go deep and find contributive factors that led this incident. accident. Um, I will suggest I look further back in time to find contributor factors that led to that incident. Contributor factors can be, as I was mentioning, maybe a dependency was bad. Maybe something happened when we were packing the tool. Maybe um, the, the particular um, instant that we were trying to, to spin up was really bad in, uh, because we, we, were up, we, went, we didn't update uh, the image for that instance, whatever. Try to figure out contributor factors that affect the, the, the issue rather than thinking the, the most obvious that maybe is the code. Sometimes it's not the code. Uh, there is no single root cause in a complex system, obviously. It, it, the, the example of the infrastructure we had is just a really easy system, but uh, we are gonna be facing applications that have com complex integrations, and maybe some parts were failing. Maybe an integration test failed for some reason, or we, we weren't covering that integration at all. Uh, but a combination of contributing factors together lead to the failure also. Uh, constantly monitor of affected systems. Once we start seeing that something is not functioning well, try to set these monitors to these systems or, or services in order like to just make sure that we have a period of time where we're not gonna be worrying about this at all. And then you can set like, um, remove that mark of that service or service because it's getting back to normal in maybe in, uh, in the weekend or, or a week or a month, whatever makes sense to you and the business. Search for irregularities like sudden spikes or flattening when the easy that began. And that's why we use a lot of dashboards. Uh, if we see spikes that are like not uh, a normal behavior or flattening, let's say, hey, we, we are not receiving any connections to the database. So maybe that's a particular issue. And we, we need to be really sure about those spikes and flattening and what does that mean in our dashboards. And the end of a major incident, we we, um, we need to define an owner. Uh, it can be the person that took over ownership of uh, isolate and sterilize the system, uh, or it, it can be someone else. The idea is that uh, the owner takes the post-mortem that will lead to a documentation efforts that we were discussing uh, in the previous slides. And a post-mortem is just a meeting where we communicate the findings of our incident to the teams, aligned to facts, always to facts, events, Changes, maybe we change from instance, uh, uh, maybe we create a vertical increase of the instances, maybe we change some factors in, auto skill, in, a, in our auto scaling uh, group policies, whatever change you did, try to document it there. Uh, the status of the services uh, before, uh, in, the, in, in, in the moment and after, and the impact that we we're discussing about the impact uh, of, of, of those uh, incidents. and. What are the, maybe the, the topics that you will be interesting about to communicate? Because remember, um, the incidents, um, 
we, we don't want incidents, but we need to communicate them in order like to make better uh, plan for the future and, and don't let like, hey, if I don't tell anyone, maybe no one will notice that we were down like 15 minutes. It's not the idea. Um, we need to take like uh, the responsibility to communicate everyone in the team and all like be aware that that could be a possibility and uh, a risk factor in order like to um, make better our business and our clients' business. The owner of the postmodern is responsible for the following. Scheduling the meeting and invite relevant people. And please invite just relevant people, not, uh, you know, sometimes meetings can take out of control and we start inviting everyone, but we try to focus on relevant people that can help us to, um, to solve possible risk uh, issues with, with, with this that we found uh, in, in the event of the incident. Also, pulling whoever is needed from other teams to assist the investigation is really relevant. Maybe we were uh, checking with the software engineer team or uh, the production team, uh, or maybe we, we need to call someone from our cloud provider, from AWS or GCP. Whoever, whoever can help us to, to this investigation uh, is trying to pull, uh, pull this person in, in, in the conversation. Uh, creating follow-up follow tickets and adding necessary documentation, um, adding to the backlog or maybe prioritize that in the next sprint, but uh, we need to create the tickets for, for following up. And reviewing post-mortem content with our preferred partners, uh, parties, sorry. Um, sometimes maybe we don't need to involve the CEO, but maybe we need to involve uh, other areas like uh, marketing, or maybe pre-sales, or maybe someone that uh, needs to be aware that this is a risk. So the post is to invite everyone that could take action uh, after we see this event and we stabilize and maybe do the better communication about uh, all the users that were affected. How are we gonna be compensating? How are we gonna be communicating that we are working for this? and it's not going to be an issue because we want happy customers and happy users. Uh, and also at the end, communicate the results of the postmortem internally. We need to do like uh, following like the, the action items uh, triggered by this uh, postmortem. In summary, let's see like, the lessons learned. Okay. Overall, uh, when an incident happens, we need to pay attention to events and document facts, always facts. Look for information in dashboards or data in logs. Um, also track down the services of instances that could be compromised by, by this incident. And then analyze, analyze services uh, or instances looking for high load that could be CPU, memory, or IO load usage. Um, most of these issues are related to high load, mostly high load and maybe integration, but uh, in my experience, high load is always there and you, we need to do something about that. So the next steps is a good idea to define an improvement plan for the high load, uh, like integrate monitoring agents to your application for CPU, memory, and metrics. If you don't have it, try to integrate those agents. Understand your application's logic. Sometimes as SRE or cloud infrastructure engineers, we don't bother about the application, but uh, that's a good, uh, that's a bad sign of, uh, of leading of failure in the future. We need to understand what are we building and the infrastructure supporting that, uh, that applications and identify user scenarios. I always ask to the engineers to define user scenarios, happy paths and edge cases. In, with those scenarios, we can build test environments where we can stress enough our application uh, and simulate load based on those scenarios. Maybe we start saying like, the, um, if we have like an application that, um, that uh, uh, is an e-commerce and we start seeing like in the checkout, the, the system starts getting slow. With these user scenarios, we can try uh, track down what is happening in the servers. What is happening with, uh, with all the integration of the services and uh, our APIs and maybe in the front end, back end, whatever, but try to create these scenarios and perform high load over there. Uh, identify thresholds is measure the limits of the instances you're using. If, you're, if your applications break faster with high load, uh, vertical growth might be needed. 
But uh, the issue, well, the, the, the thing that we focus on is identify those thresholds based on your load test when CPU and memory starts to collapse. And this is why we define uh, our user scenarios, our happy paths at each cases to try to break the application and define when we need to start setting those thresholds. Maybe our application is breaking in the 50% of the CPU because the memory is start getting crazy. We need to set threshold, but also we need to talk with the software engineering team and you know, all like, hey, we start seeing a lot of high load with the memory. And maybe we can um, create a microservice for that particular uh, uh, process or, or, or model. And it's important to identify those thresholds uh, when you perceive this degradation of your application. Apply the safety margin. Let's say that we start seeing like the 60% of, uh, of CPU is breaking our application. So maybe we can set up safety margin of 50% to 20% depends of how, how wild you like to be in production. So let's say that is breaking in 60, maybe we can go with 45 or 50, that depends on you and maybe do some tests, uh, maybe do a lot of load tests and maybe in, in, in staging, you can perform this test with, uh, uh, with the stakeholders and some user, some test users plus uh, your high load uh, uh, user agents. And with that threshold, once you define, uh, apply to uh, your auto scaling groups and not just go with the default of 70 or 80%. Other than see your dashboard based on those thresholds and set on call groups. It's really important to have call groups. Um, I think that's it from my part, from the tricks and, uh, and tips for uh, maybe a fail in our systems and try to set the thresholds, try to identify the documentation and an action plan. Anyone have a, a particular question or comment? We had a question in the chat that I'll flag for you from Miguel. Uh, they asked, can the owner of a postmortem be the developer's team? Sure, sure. I think that uh, developer's team um, can be the owner of the postmortem. And the, the idea of, of the postmortem is that you can talk with anyone in the team, SREs, uh, production engineers, uh, whomever. You try to figure out to pull all the pieces of the jigsaw and try to understand the reality of what happened in the, in the incident. Awesome. Thank you, Edwin. Does anyone else have any questions? You're more than welcome to just unmute and share. Or any comments? We've got a hand raised from Fernando. Uh, hello, Edwin. Uh, does something like chaos engineering can help with uh, to, to, I don't know, to create like these edge scenarios where something fails and can help us to uh to 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 prevent some uh, some issues in the in in the production system uh chaos engineering can help but uh we need to remember that the objective of chaos engineering is uh, if we start uh, unplugging everything from uh, from our system how how much time we're, um, we're gonna be getting in an um normal state of our, of our application or how our application is resilient to those changes. Yeah, you can apply ca uh, cause engineering and start seeing like maybe the thresholds start like um, making nonsense if something like an attack will happen, maybe a degradation of other, uh, of, of, of other uh, systems that are integrating in our main system. So yeah, I, I could say that uh, we can integrate both approaches but once we set uh, the, our thresholds for our application, that we can go with uh, with that methodology of chaos engineering. Okay, thank you. So the first thing will be to define the threshold and then apply chaos engineering, right? Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, thank you. And we got another question in the chat from Alex. Wouldn't it be a good idea to create two thresholds, one for warning and another one for critical events with different percentages? Yeah, the, I, I think that's a, that's a safe uh, place where you can set a threshold for uh, maybe um, ask for help from, a, from an engineer that, hey, we start seeing like this part uh, of, of maybe it's a warning. Um, 
we have like both sides of uh, I, maybe the engineers that are on call in that time, maybe it's not gonna work to maybe uh, warn those engineers but because maybe that happens in the middle of the night and you'll say, okay, let me check. Oh, it was warning. But I, I could say that uh, warnings are a good idea if we have uh, like an automated way of of taking considerations in, in, in that incident. Let's say that we have a process that uh, start working in, in the middle of the nine uh, and try to fetch data from a database and that we are processing that in the server. And we start seeing like the amount of CPU or memory, it's start increasing and we surpassing the warning. And our clients from the other side of the world are gonna be like going in this application. So maybe, this, this warning threshold can help us to trigger another event that will like maybe, hey, stop the process, just say what you have, clean the data, and maybe we can resume this process of, um, of making uh, the report later because we are gonna be attending the peak from the users from other side of the world that are in, uh, that are in different time zones. But it's a good idea to have two, two thresholds but the main threshold that we have that they, uh, we want like critical events is once uh, an engineer will step in and try to solve the issue as fast and as they can. Awesome. Thank you, Edwin. Okay, we have some more questions in the chat. Johan, I don't know if I pronounced that name right. Bear with me. Uh, when is there another meeting? Great question. Edwin is in high demand. <laughs> But we're going to try and have um, a bunch of events this year for SRE, so please stay tuned. Luis asks, what we do is, I don't know if this is a question, I'm actually just reading this for the first time. <laughs> what we do is set times for alarms to be resolved. If it hasn't been resolved in X minutes, notify of Escalate additional people. Interesting. I think that's a suggestion. <laughs> Does anyone yeah. have any questions? Any more questions? Do you think that it is necessary an on-call scheduling? First, let's answer, answer Martin's question about on-call scheduling, and then Carlos, after that, uh, we can share your comment. Um, I think it's necessary to have an on-call scheduling. Yeah, it's always important. Um, the idea of the on-call scheduling is that uh, have uh, engineers rotated every certain amount of time and are like, if those thresholds for a critical event start triggering, uh, they first of all send messages and call to your to your phone and automated way of uh, uh, to, to, to tell the engineers, hey, something is happening, please go to your computer and check it out. I think it's a good, uh, a good practice to have an on-call, but we need to set our thresholds really well because we don't, we don't want a false positive or a false negative uh, in order like waking up an engineer in the middle of the night because it was a false threshold. So it's important and it's our duty to set our thresholds as, as, uh, as real as possible to our um, production state and the things that we can um, get uh, with all the scenarios that we have defined. <laughs> yeah. Call is a necessary evil, but uh, again, try to think about the thresholds and uh, not create this bias of, hey, maybe fifty percent is right. No, maybe that's not accurate for the reality of your application. Awesome, thank you, Edwin. All right, let's give the mic to Carlos, who has a comment. Go for it, Carlos. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Edwin, for this great presentation. I'm also learning a lot. Um, Edwin, I want to ask you, maybe in this uh, Zoom presentation, we have people from different countries who, who doesn't know what's the purpose of Academy at Wiseline. Um, maybe some people that uh, doesn't know Wiseline. So I, I like to hear from you, what is the purpose of, of Academy and give a brief presentation of, of who we are at Wiseline. I really appreciate it. Carlos, I was ready and prepared for your comment. I have some slides. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, here I go. Perfect segue. 
So <laughs> how did you know? I'm honestly impressed. So I'll give a brief overview of WiseLine and WiseLine Academy for those of you who are new here. And for those of you that aren't new here, just stick along because I've got, uh, a, well, feedback that I need from you at the end. So an overview of WiseLine. Hold on, let me hide my face. It's very big right now. All right, so WiseLine builds digital products and platforms for companies like Etsy, Disney, and Rappi. We've got a team now of close to 2,000 people, so we're growing super fast, and we have lots of opportunities to accelerate your career development here. Um, so if you're interested, if you're not already a WiseLiner, if you're interested to learn more, stay tuned. WiseLine Academy is where I work. I'm a, I'm a program manager at WiseLine Academy. Um, and we were founded on the belief that talent can be nurtured with access to education. So we provide free learning courses, content, boot camps, webinars like this one, and workshops to both WiseLiners at our company and to the community, totally for free and open to anyone um, who obviously has knowledge on the topic, but wherever you are in the world, you can join us. And throughout 2021, we taught over 624 courses to 27,000 students of 77 nationalities. And something that we're really proud of is 45% of participants in WiseLine Academy events and courses and programs we're able to land new job opportunities thanks to their participation in the academy. So we're really excited about learning. We're really excited about technology and we're bringing both of those together to provide learning experiences like this one. And now that I've given a bit of an overview, I wanna hear from all of you. Uh, we really hope that you enjoyed this webinar and I would love, love, love if you could provide us with some feedback before you go. You can use this QR code. If you just scan it, it'll open up the feedback survey and I'm going to put the link in the chat. Um, please give us your, inform or your information, your feedback, <laughs> your opinions, um, anything that we can do to improve, let us know. And there's also a section on there if you're interested in learning more about WiseLine um, and the job opportunities that we have, you can indicate that on the chat and we will reach out to you. So I'll leave this up for a couple of minutes. I wonder, I think my chat might be blocking it so that you can access it, but please provide us your feedback. We are super happy to see you today. Um, and thank you, massive thank you to Edwin uh, for giving this webinar. I hope you all learned something and we're able to expand your brain with knowledge today. Um, it's been a pleasure having you. So thank you so much. What question in the chat, when is the next Academy starting? We have events happening all the time. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be working on publishing our schedule for the year for all of the disciplines. For SRE, we're currently in the planning stages of a boot camp. So stay tuned on our website. Um, if you go to WiseLine Academy, the website, um, you'll see the upcoming courses. And once the application is ready for the SRE boot camp, that will be published there. Um, but we'll also have you know lots more courses coming. So stay tuned to our website and also our social media. You can follow us on all of our social channels at WiseLine Academy and any upcoming events or courses will be posted there. So thank you so much, everybody. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day or evening, whatever time zone you're in. Thank you for making time for us. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Thank you.